We need a way to save or persist our data in such a way that it hangs around longer than just one request. Now you could use a database like Postgres or MySQL or something like that for this, but I'm going to use Redis. And in order to get Redis up and running as quickly as possible, I'm going to use Docker and specifically Docker Compose. You're welcome to get Redis up and running however you see fit. There are tutorials on using Docker Compose elsewhere on the site. Honestly, it's not that tricky. It's probably more scary than it is difficult. In the bottom tab, I'm running Docker Compose up against the new Docker Compose file. And when this process finishes, I should have a Redis instance up and running with the available port of 6401 mapped to 6379 internally on that container. The port is remapped simply to make life easier if you're running multiple Redis instances on your computer, whether it's for this project or other projects. I just use an incrementing value. 6401 has literally no other meaning than that. Back in the setup of this tutorial series, we included both Redis and the Redis type definitions in our package.json. So we already have the node compatible library locally available and ready for us to use. I've created my redis.ts file inside the storage directory, and I'm gonna start off by defining an interface. And this is a sort of departure from standard JavaScript really. Now WebStorm is trying to be helpful here and it's suggesting that the interface name is that of the file. But in this case, we don't want to think about such a concretion. We want to think in a more abstract fashion. And in this case, we want to think more about all kinds of storage and how Redis would be one of those kind of storages that implements this particular interface. In theory, though it's more difficult sometimes in practice, the idea with an interface is that we can swap out different implementations without changing the behavior of the system. And the more you can decouple your system in this way, the nicer your system is basically to work with. We're covering two of the things that I think make software development really difficult in this video. The first is that we're defining this interface and I'm just telling you what to put on this interface. But the truth is, this is a trial and error process that requires quite a lot of thought. It's really difficult for me to get that across in a video, but I'd like to be honest with you and say that this is not something that I just type out off the top of my head. And secondly, we're gonna look at the function signatures for these functions, which you will already be aware of how to do, but defining it explicitly with TypeScript can be a little bit of a brain bender, I find, the first few times that you have to do it. Thinking about storage in a more abstract way kind of leads to three different methods. We want to be able to get everything that's in the storage. We want to be able to add an item to the storage. And we also want to be able to remove an item from the storage. I'm thinking about my persistence as being one big list of things. I'm not gonna be able to get individual items from the list, but I am going to be able to get everything in that list. I just need to provide the list name and that's going to return an array that contains just strings. When I want to add an item to a list, I'm gonna to have to provide the list name and also the item that I want to add. And that should return either true or false depending on whether the item was successfully added to the list or not. The same goes for removing an item from a list. I'm gonna to have to provide the list name and also the item as a string and that should return true or false if the item was successfully removed. Now that we've got an interface, we can create our first implementation of the interface, which in this case is gonna be our Redis storage implementation and to implement an interface, it's the same syntax as we've seen already. Just use the colon and then the name of the type that in this case we wish to implement. The initial implementation of Redis storage is almost a copy paste of the interface. Just swapping out the TypeScript types, such as the string array and the booleans to be JavaScript values of just a raw array and the boolean of false. We'll come back to this shortly, but we do have a more immediate concern. So imagine that we have a variation of our iStorage interface. Let's say we want to add in a Postgres implementation. As we've defined the iStorage interface inside the Redis implementation file, we wouldn't want to import from Redis inside our Postgres implementation. That would be really weird. Instead, I personally prefer to move all my interfaces and other definitions from the individual files, such as the Redis TS file, and out into somewhere more centralized, such as the types interfaces.definition.typescript file. Now you don't have to do this, but I've found that as your project grows in complexity, this method does scale better. I'm using the import star as syntax, simply to import everything that's exported from the interfaces module, rather than having to import individual things bit by bit. In a previous video, we defined the iConfig interface. So I'm gonna extract that out as well and place that centrally also. 
In doing this, we demonstrate the immediate benefit of using the import star syntax because we're using that same import statement, but we're just changing the specific export. In this case, it would be interfaces.iconfig rather than having to import iconfig explicitly in this file. It's of course personal preference, but I find this is a little bit more explicit and a little bit easier to use on larger projects. With that piece of refactoring done, I'm gonna create a Redis client. And in order to do that, I'm gonna to have to require Redis. Now why require and not import? Simply, I was hitting on some issues with TypeScript complaining when I was using import. So I switched back to using require. I honestly can't tell you what the reason behind that was as I didn't figure it out, but I've just found that require worked in this case and allowed me to continue. So I'm not gonna dwell on that, but if you know the reason as to why that would have been happening, I would appreciate a comment. I'm always interested in learning a little bit more. There are a number of options we can provide when creating a client. Don't need many of them. In our case, we just need the port and the host. As these are pieces of config, I'm gonna add them onto my config object, which first means updating the iConfig interface. It's pretty straightforward. Our Redis host is going to be a string and the port will be a number. As soon as we've done that, the config object is going to be in a broken state because we've not defined those particular values. So we need to immediately update the config object with a Redis key under which we have the host and the port. For both of these values, I'm gonna say that we can get them from the process env, in other words, environment variables that are passed in when we first start up our application. But I'm also gonna say I'm providing a default or a fallback value, which in our case, we're gonna use directly. So the Redis host will be straightforward. That's the 0000, our local host. That's because Docker's running on our local host. So that's how we will connect. For the port, we get a little bit more fancy. You don't need to do this in this way, but I just want to show you an alternative approach. As we covered in a previous video, all environment variables are strings. So TypeScript's expecting that we get back a string here, which is fine. We can parse the integer value from that provided string and turn it into an integer. But TypeScript is still not happy with that because it's saying that what if this value is not even set? How can we pass an int that's not there? So instead we have to provide a further check that says if this value is set and it's a string, then pass it into an integer. If not, fall back to 6401. Once we've done all that, we can update the redis.ts file to create a client from our config object. Now the truth is I've saved the best for last in this video. Things are about to get a little bit more complicated. And I can only apologize for this, but this is the real world of working with code. Let's start by seeing the revised implementation. Now there is quite a lot to cover here, but immediately what I'm going to do is update the interface to return a promise of the given type. So in this case, a promise of a string array, a promise of Boolean. As an interesting side note, a promise is a generic in TypeScript, which is why we use the promise and then the angle brackets with the type that we're returning inside it. So we could return anything inside that promise. And whilst generics are a more advanced topic, it's interesting to note that they are in use here. To understand why we need to use promises, we have to think about our actual implementation. And we can see it on screen here. This is a more simplified version of what we'll come up with in a later video, but essentially this shows the problem. Our top level function is asynchronous. We've already covered that this function doesn't need to return because it's interacting directly with that context object and that's defined in a higher scope. The problem being here that when that ultimately returns to our end user, our API consumer, if we were using the provided functionality by the Redis library, we would be using a callback in this case as our fourth argument. And it's highly likely that that callback will not have resolved by the time that the response is returned to the consumer. And so this can lead to a very inconsistent experience for the API consumer. The solution to this is to promiseify the existing Redis library functions. And promiseify is a utility provided by Node that takes an existing function and turns it into a promise-based version of that function. Because we're redefining the function, we need to ensure that what this function knows as this is what we expect it to be. In other words, when our push or LREM or L range is called against something that we call the client, we need to make sure that that something is actually the client. And for that, we can call bind passing in the client, which will become the this on this newly created function. I appreciate there's been a lot to take in in this video, especially at the end here with what has to be one of JavaScript's weirder quirks. 
Well done for getting through this video. And if you haven't done already, go and grab yourself a coffee. In the next video, we'll look at potentially ways to test this and maybe even whether you should.